In Pakistan, outrage and anger on both sides of the Asiya Bibi blasphemy case, sparking renewed debate about religion and free speech. Blasphemy laws, who are the real victims? Welcome to Plugged In, I'm Greta Van Susteren, and on today's show, a look at laws against blasphemy. This one involving Asiya Bibi, a Christian Pakistani mother of five, convicted in 2010 of blasphemy, sentenced to death by hanging, but just recently acquitted. Her crime? Her accusers say she insulted the Prophet Muhammad. We'll hear from a Pakistani government official and activist on why the violent protests in Pakistan over Asiya Bibi. We'll also hear from a commissioner on religious freedom and from Amnesty International and from VOA reporters around the globe. We are live on Facebook at Voice America, and we would love to hear your comments and questions. And a report by the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom says that around the world, 71 countries consider blasphemy a criminal act, and the punishment varies from country to country. But in at least six of those 71 countries, blasphemy is a crime punishable by death. Those six countries are Afghanistan, Iran, Nigeria, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and Somalia. And two weeks ago, Pakistan's Supreme Court reversed a 2010 guilty verdict against the Christian woman sentenced to hanging for insulting the Prophet Muhammad. Her acquittal was immediately met by violent protests throughout Pakistan. Here is VOA's Aisha Tanzim with more on the Asiya Bibi blasphemy case. The violence that followed the Supreme Court verdict brought life to a halt in several main cities in Pakistan. An Islamist party called Tehrike Labak Pakistan passed an edict declaring the justices worthy of death. It also demanded the removal of the current government and called for a mutiny in the army. In an address to the nation, the Prime Minister warned TLP not to challenge the writ of the state. If you do this, let me make it clear to you. The state will fulfill its responsibility. People's lives and property will be protected. Do not force the state to take action. But soon after, the government signed a deal with them. It promised to take legal steps to bar the accused woman, Asya Bibi, from leaving the country and release all arrested TLP members. Human rights activists were livid. We demand that treason cases and anti-terrorism cases should be registered against the leaders of Tehrik Labak Pakistan and they should not be allowed to go scot-free. We condemn the agreement which the government did with them. We believe that this was a capitulation or a surrender by the state. <laughs> The blasphemy accusation against Bibi stems from a 10-year-old altercation over a glass of water. She offered a drink to her fellow female workers, some of whom declined, saying they wouldn't drink from the hands of a Christian. A heated argument ensued. Bibi told the court the women falsely accused her of blasphemy. In Pakistan, that's a crime punishable by death. She was convicted in 2010. Even though the Supreme Court has acquitted her, the Islamists want to kill her, so the government is keeping her in a secret place for now. Aisha Tanzim, VOA News, Islamabad. To help us understand how the Pakistani government is handling the BB case, Aisha spoke to the Pakistani Information Minister, Fawad Chaudhry. Thank you, Minister, for joining us today. Let me start by asking that for now your government is keeping Asiya Bibi safe, but what are your long-term plans for her? Are you talking in? Which countries are you talking with to help her get out of Pakistan once the review petition is done? Or what else is in her future? Well, Asiya Bibi is a Pakistani citizen, and obviously uh, her uh, security is a concern for, for Pakistan, is a concern of Pakistani state. and. Uh, it's not for the government to decide. Uh, once you will have, we will have a court verdict, and only then the things will be for more clear. That uh, how she wants to spend her life uh, is for her to decide how she wants to proceed about. You made a deal with TLP now, uh, but if the Supreme Court maintains its decision in the review, they'll be out on the streets again. Then what? 
Well, government of Pakistan has to stand with the Supreme Court decision. Uh, we are uh, we are bound by the Constitution, and uh, Supreme Court is the is the Supreme Court of Pakistan, and the decisions of Supreme Court are binding on all the citizens and the government. If you couldn't control them the first time around, why do you think you'll control them the second time? Well, it's not a deal, frankly. Uh, it's a firefighting. The issue is that the issue has not been created in 50 or 60 days. We have been in government for about 70 days. It has a history to it. Now this needs a long-term planning to def to kind of you know to cure this situation. And for fire firefighting, we have a short-term planning. We did. We achieved you know the def we diffused all these crowds. Uh, without any violence, without you know firing a single bullet, we've been able to disperse these crowds. And now, in the short term, we we have our own uh, you can say strategy. And in the long term, we have our own strategy. With the deal with the TLP, hasn't the government emboldened not just this group but every violent group? Haven't you sent a message that if a group can use brute force, the government will capitulate? This is the analysis of those who don't know Pakistani society. And when you have a crisis in the society, you don't you know, try to solve it by violence. You try to solve it by dialogue. Now the problem right now is that in Pakistan, the, the space for free dialogue has shrinked. And our primary aim is that to take narrative back from these extremists. Islam is not, obviously Islam doesn't teach what they are telling us, telling the people to do. Islam is a, is a religion of peace, but they have taken a totally different narrative. It is not an issue of the government or the state, it's an issue of society. And this issue needs a, a very comprehensive strategy. We have that, we are working on that, and hopefully we will get results. Thank you once again for your time. And Aisha also spoke with prominent Pakistani human rights activist Tahira Abdullah. Taira, thank you so much for joining us on VOA. Now, the government is saying that it avoided bloodshed by making a deal with TLP. Why do you think that's wrong? I think anybody who believes in the rule of law, in the writ of the state, in the constitutional provisions and safeguards for fundamental freedoms and liberties and fundamental human rights will all disagree that this was for the best for Pakistan. This was totally wrong. It was an abject surrender. It was capitulation of the most cowardly kind. And what is worse than capitulation and surrender, I firmly believe that it starts us down the slippery slope of appeasement. What do you think the government really should have done in this case? They could have used water cannons, they could have used tear gas. Other than shooting either to kill or not to kill, other than a shooting war, we could have done so many things. These, these are riot control and crowd control measures used against people like us who are peaceful human rights defenders, peaceful protesters for our basic fundamental human rights. Water cannons are used, tear gas is used, baton charges are used, crowd control measures are used, a few people get arrested, even if temporarily. Why were th these peaceful measures not taken by the state? Given that you say the Supreme Court acquitted her because of lack of evidence, why do you think the trial court and then the high court convicted her? In a country where there is no witness protection program, no judicial protection program, no lawyer protection program. Here we have the martyrdom of advocate Rashid Rahman, who was killed by the mullahs, the religious right, simply for defending an alleged blasphemy case, not a convicted blasphemy case. He just happened to be the lawyer in the court of Multan, and he was threatened inside the court in front of the judges and still the state did not protect him. They walked in with impunity into his chambers, into his legal office at, in the evening after the court was closed, and they came and killed him in cold blood. They killed Clement Shabazz Bhatti, federal minister for religious affairs and minorities affairs.
they killed the sitting governor of the Punjab province, Salman Taseer. Do you really want a long list? I have here a long list in an article I wrote four years ago. And so I do not find it in my heart to sit in judgment and blame those who are intimidated and scared for their lives. Aisha Tanzim joins us from Islamabad, Pakistan, with more on the political and social impact of the BB case in the region. Welcome back, Aisha. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me, Greta. Aisha, two questions. Watching from halfway around the world, my thought is this is how big is the TLP in, in terms of uh, in numbers? Is it a huge movement within Pakistan? And secondly, the blasphemy laws. Do you have a sense living there that there's widespread acceptance and, and agreement with the blasphemy laws? Or do, or do more, most Pakistanis now want to sort of move away from it? So uh, uh, with the first question, the TLP is a newly emerged party. It's now registered as a political party. In the last election, it fielded 500 candidates, and they got uh, about 2 million uh, votes uh, across the country. Um, and nobody knows um, what the exact uh, number of TLP is. Uh, but the issue is that this blasphemy issue is so emotional that many people who may not be officially members of TLP feel very strongly about it. So now when it comes to blasphemy law, none of the human rights defenders in Pakistan have accepted it. But the problem is that just discussing the laws, two people that Tahira mentioned, the very powerful governor and a sitting minister, were killed just because they talked about the need to review these laws. They weren't even talking about repealing the laws. They were just talking about the need to review it. So okay. just a discussion on the laws is dangerous. Oh, well, I've, I've, I've learned that uh, her lawyer, I, uh, her lawyer has fled at least for temporary asylum in Netherlands, temporary, not permanent, because he's under death threat. What is the risk to her? And um, if the if the acquittal is is upheld, is you know, is she at danger? I don't think she can ever be safe in Pakistan. We have a long list of people who died for mere accusations, and she was at one time convicted. So she will have to uh, find asylum in some other country. Uh, what the precedent is in Pakistan is usually uh, by the time the court announces its decision, very quietly they're sent uh, abroad. She, like she's in safekeeping now, uh, government's um, you know keeping her in a safe place. Most likely than not, uh, we will find out after the decision that she, she's moved abroad. There was a governor, was there not, uh, who supported her who uh, during the patent between the time that she was tried in 2010 and now who was murdered because he supported her by one of his guards? Exactly. That's the governor who supported her, who said that even if she's convicted, he's going to tell, ask the president to pardon her. And he also talked about repealing the blasphemy laws or at least reviewing it. And that led to his own security guard killing him. And when the guard killed him, uh, the shocking thing for the world was that the guard uh, became a hero. Uh, there were lawyers who were showering rose petals on him, and even though the government uh, convicted him and in the end gave him death penalty and hung him, uh, you know, people now go to his grave, and he is actually the hero of TLP. TLP considers him uh, their uh, role model. Prime Minister Khan, who uh, we just saw a little video of his statement, does he have pretty much control of, of the country? Because I know they've got protests on the street, but he says you know, law and order is going to govern this. Um, does he have enough influence? He's new. Well, what we saw with the government was that two days after the prime minister made that very strong statement that everybody hailed in the country, uh, they made a deal with TLP, which the human rights defenders called capitulation. So whether they'll be able to stand the pressure next time, this is not the first time his government has backed off under Islamist pressure. Uh, previously, when he appointed an economist on his uh, team uh, who was an Ahmadi, um, a persecuted minority in uh, in Pakistan. Uh, there was a hue and cry about it from the Islamists, and he backed off from that decision. So uh, he's saying that uh, the government will establish its writ and uh, the law and order will prevail, but whether he'll be able to withstand the pressure from the Islamists, uh, we have yet to see that. Aisha, thank you very much. Well, thanks again for having me. For more on how the BB acquittal on blasphemy charges is resonating around the world, we have a roundup from two VOA reporters. Let's start with Henry Ridgewell in London.
I'm Henry Ridgewell in London and here in Europe the debate over blasphemy laws continues to be fought over fiercely in many different states. In France, of course, in 2015 there was that terror attack against staff in the offices of the satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo after it published pictures of the Prophet Muhammad. That, of course, stoked the debate over blasphemy laws across the continent. And then in the Netherlands, just this summer, uh, the far-right politician here at Wilders held a competition for cartoonists to draw pictures of the Prophet Muhammad, further stoking the debate there. Of course, many Muslims consider depicting the Prophet to be blasphemous. And blasphemy laws are still on the statute books of several European states, including uh, Greece, Poland and Germany. Uh, meanwhile, in Ireland just last month, uh, voters uh, voted in a referendum to repeal laws on blasphemy there. So you can see that in Europe, different countries are pulling in different directions on the blasphemy issue. I'm Heather Murdoch, VOA's Middle East correspondent and Istanbul bureau chief. In the vast majority of the Middle East, there are laws against blasphemy and apostasy, including countries like Saudi Arabia and Iran, where a person convicted of either abandoning their religion or insulting religion can be executed. Even in countries like Turkey, which is technically secular, blasphemy is often prosecuted under laws against things like hate speech or disturbing the peace. Uh, but the people I've talked to who have either left their religion or said something that could be construed as insulting religion say that they are more afraid of vigilantes in this deeply religious region than they are even of the law. We met atheists who were living in hiding for fear of the law or of being attacked on the streets. In other Middle Eastern countries, laws against apostasy or blasphemy are hijacked by hardliners and used as an excuse for harsh punishments. The most dramatic example of this was Islamic State militants who murdered former soldiers, police officers, government workers, and many other people, all in the name of apostasy. Now, back to Plugged In. So what is the United States position on these nations' blasphemy laws? For that, we are joined by Commissioner Gary Bauer. He is with the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. He's also president of the conservative think tank American Values and served as Under Secretary of Education under former President Ronald Reagan. Nice to see you, sir. Great to see you, Greta. Gary, um, we have a very strong constitution. We have yes. freedom of press and freedom of speech. So it's very plain where the United States mm -hmm. stands on this. Seventy-one other nations have other laws. And we just heard the, what's going on in Pakistan. Is it our business what the Pakistani law is on blasphemy? Well, and by I, our, I mean the United States. Sure. Well, speaking for the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom, the United States has always taken a position around the world that religious liberty, religious freedom, is extremely important. And these laws that are passed in so many countries around the world, even though they're done in the name of religious liberty, actually end up restricting religious liberty. They're used against minority religions. Uh, they're used to harass people. They're often used, false charges, as we've heard, are, are used in order to get even with somebody. It limits freedom of speech. And because of the values we believe in in the United States, and quite frankly, the universal values that are being promoted around the world, we do think this is something that concerns us. Does U.S. foreign policy use, I mean, is this, uh, is this an issue raised typically in U.S. foreign policy when we're doing other things with these other nations, mm -hmm. whether it's weapons deals or, you know, tariffs or anything else? Is this, is this an issue, a ripe issue? It, it depends on the administration, the degree to which religious liberty issues and specifically something like anti-blasphemy laws is raised. I, my experience with the Trump administration has been that they've been fairly aggressive in promoting these values with a whole host of countries around the world that are either discriminating against one religion or another or in some cases have laws that they're using to harass religious minorities. Well, with the U.S. deep conviction about freedom of religion and the fact it's in our Constitution, does that mean or suggest that the U.S. should offer asylum to this woman? Because that's going to become an issue. Once the court rules or there's a final decision, if, if that acquittal stands, she's got to go someplace. She can't stay in Pakistan. Is the U.S. an alternative? Uh, I don't think the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom has taken an official position on that, but I can tell you that as a commissioner and a number of the other commissioners I've spoken to, we would like very much for her to be uh, admitted to the United States if that's where she would choose to go. There's already a report just today that Great Britain may have 
uh, caved in to pressure from their Pakistani immigrant population to not accept her there. I haven't confirmed that, but if that's true, that's very disturbing. But isn't that an issue, is that, is that we put at risk, for instance, if we, uh, I mean, any nation puts at risk, whether it's its embassies in Islamabad or any part of the world, is that when you grant asylum to someone who is, you know, for lack of a better word, radioactive in a country, and she obviously, had, um, what happened to her has uh, provoked lots of protests on the street in Pakistan, mm -hmm. that you put at risk, and there's sort of behind the scenes a lot of diplomatic concern about what, what happens. Well, th there are people that have to worry about security issues and so forth. But if the United States starts retreating on these issues or not being a haven for a woman like the one that we're discussing right now, then I think we give up so much of our own values that it makes any security issues pale in comparison. The United States historically has stood for these values, even if that meant there's a mob outside of our embassy. That's just part of the life in a modern world. You know, it's rather, I mean, as an American, having, as a lawyer and having studied the Constitution, it's, it surprised me, 71 countries, um, you know, and obviously, you know, people have deep uh, belief in their religion, but these blasphemy laws with the death penalty in six, at least six nations, um, it, you know, it, it's, it's so different from what our experience is. It, it is very different. Uh, fortunately, the number is going down, but it's going down very slowly. The uh, people of Ireland voted not too long ago to repeal their law. Which would but take even it, that they had one for so long, the fact that Ireland had one for so long until just recently is surprising to me. It, it is, but you know, it was honored in the breach in, this, in the sense that it wasn't being enforced. And I think that's the case with a number of European countries that have these laws. Germany has one. Yes, they do. But in the Middle East, these laws are being enforced often in a way that not only violates the religious liberty of religious minorities, but as I mentioned, is used to get even with people or to harass people or to make uh, people limit their freedom of speech. But doesn't Germany, send, by Germany not enforcing their law, but looking the other way, not removing their law from the books, doesn't that send a message uh, symbolically to the countries that are enforcing it? It, it does. And one What's of the their back off from uh, just getting rid of the law? I, I, you know, I'm not quite sure what Germany's argument is. I would think that under their historical circumstances, they ought to be very aggressive in getting a law like that off of the books. And you're absolutely right. Countries that are enforcing the law will point to European countries having the law on the books as justification for the fact that they have these laws in Pakistan, Iran, and other nations. And underlying all this is that, at least right now, as it stands, she was falsely accused that these were that this was just concocted. In fact, the, the Supreme Court said it's mo more, much more likely that she was the wronged person, the person sinned against, rather than somebody that had committed a sin. And that's what happens in these cultures when somebody gets into an argument with you, is otherwise offended by something you've done, and their first thought is, I'm going to get even, I'm going to accuse you of this terrible crime. But uh, she had a number of years in solitary confinement. Um, Horrible. Horrible. Eight years, I believe. And, and no matter where she goes, her life, I think, will probably be at risk. I'm afraid that's true. Anyway, Gary, thank you very much. Great to be with yeah. you. Amnesty International has been among the groups spotlighting the human toll of blasphemy cases such as the Asiya Bibi case. Omar Warash is Amnesty International's deputy director in South Asia. He is also a writer, journalist, and human rights campaigner. Thank you for joining us, Omar. And before we talk Thank about, you, about what's going on in Pakistan, Amnesty International recently made news when it withdrew its highest honor, the Ambassador of Conscience Award from Myanmar State Councilor Aung San Suu Kyi. So that's also in the news. Thank you, Omar, for joining us. Thank you, Gressa. Omar, uh, tell me, sort of, give me the big picture on the blasphemy laws in, term, in terms of what toll it's taking around the world. Well, I mean, I mean, as your guests have already pointed out and your reporters have very eloquently uh, conveyed, um, there are a number of laws which are inconsistent with freedom of religion or belief and freedom of expression, uh, sometimes the same. And these aren't just blasphemy laws that are an issue of concern. I mean, for example, there are les majesty laws in Thailand where you can't criticize the king and you'll face, you'll face severe punishment. If you criticize a member of the Saudi royal family, you can be charged with terrorism. So we are talking about not just issues to do with religious freedom, but also freedom of expression in these different cases. Um, 
and they do stoke great uh, passions, as we're seeing in Pakistan and other parts of the world. Uh, and in many in many of the cases, what we've seen is governments hide behind these laws rather than take them on. And often people are also falsely accused and they get ensnared in an issue that then becomes politicized and charged up with emotion. And then the, the victims have actually nowhere to go. Do you see blasphemy coming off the books in Pakistan? I do not. No, it, it's a very neuralgic issue. I mean, it's almost like going to the deep south and saying, you know, there should be, uh, uh, you know, people should be allowed to sort of burn the flag. And you often get calls for that. Or it, it's the biggest taboo in the country. And sadly, that's what you're dealing with in that in that particular case. So while uh, what is really interesting is that the Supreme Court has upheld and said that someone has been acquitted, that these charges were false. The test is whether the government can implement that Supreme Court order, protect the judges, and protect Asya Bibi. Is she, I mean, I assume she's got to get asylum someplace. Where would you expect would be the, 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 the best place that she would go in terms of looking at the diplomacy aspect of it? Because any country that's going to take her, because this is so, such a volatile issue, is going to experience something. I don't know what it is, but it's going to get some backlash. Well, I mean, I have to correct your earlier guest. He said it's because of the Pakistani immigrant population in the UK. I mean, Greta, that would be like calling you a Dutch immigrant in America. Uh, so my my, mother, would, my mother would want you to say Irish, but uh, anyway, but... <laughs> sure. Yeah, but you get the point. Yeah, I do. Uh, and it, it wasn't that. It's the case that any government that's involved will face a backlash inside Pakistan in the sense that you have to think about the security of the staff, of the missions, of the very important assistance programs that are taking place. So it would actually be very sensitive for the UK or the US to get involved, given how that may affect relations with those countries and how it may affect staff. Uh, the likelihood is that it will be a European country that in the end, if she's able to leave, will take her in and uh, they will have the least to lose in terms of the relationship with Pakistan. Yes. The stakes are quite high for the US and the UK, given the security relationship, given other deep relationships that they have, given the development programs that they work on. Thank you very much, Omar, for joining us. Cheers. And before we go, an update on a story that we have followed very closely here on Plugged In. U.S. Vice President Mike Pence told Myanmar leader Aung San Suu Kyi that the violence against the Rohingya, in his words, without excuse, and he is, quote, very anxious to hear her plans to resolve the situation. Aung San Suu Kyi responded, perhaps curtly, we understand our country better than any other country does. Now, the two met during the annual summit of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, and the U.S. calls the 2017 attacks by the Burmese military against the Rohingya ethnic cleansing. Tens of thousands were killed and more than 700,000 Rohingya fled to nearby Bangladesh. VOA followed me on one of my recent trips to the refugee camp in Bangladesh. Here's a preview of the new documentary on the plight of the Rohingya. From Voice of America, VOA reports from inside the Kutupalong refugee camp in Bangladesh in a one-hour documentary special, Displaced. The village was burned. As the houses were set on fire, a lot of the people could not get out. Some were hacked to death or their bodies were lit on fire. Little children were thrown away violently. I just can't even imagine how, how hard this is. I, I, don't, I almost don't know what to say to you. you know, I'm at a loss for words. Sorry about how dangerous it is. How do you get cars Reported in by people? Greta Van Susteren, Displaced tells a universal story of the Rohingya so and the people trying the to so help them. If I go back to Burma, who will look after me? I lost my husband and my son is gone. I have suffered so much. Rain. This is no ordinary rain. This is Resources are in short supply and punishing weather and threatens their homes. Cut off from the surrounding society, the Rohingya's future is uncertain. Displaced tells their story of sadness, but also of hope. Thanks for being plugged in. We'll see you next week.